Hi, my name is Jordan Jace. Um, I'm here with Spencer Reese and Mark Wunderlich as Unamuno number 40. I began. Oh, okay. All right, so you guys are beautiful poets. Um, I was thinking about your collections. Yeah, how do you think of writing collections? Do you think of them as projects? For example, Road to Emmaus, right? Uh -huh. um, was the theme? Did you arrive at that beforehand? And in your case, um, it feels more like there are images that persist, let's say images of the natural world in some of the earlier collections. So just how do you think of putting together projects? Do you like stories? Do you like themes? What do you like to do? First of all, this may be our most intelligent Una Muna moment that we've ever had. <laughs> um, but I, okay, so I can, I can answer that. Um, I, the first book that I wrote took me like, like 20 years and it took a really, really long time and I was teaching myself how to do it. And it made a very particular sound in the world once it, uh, it went into the world which I never thought it was going to do but once it was out it made the sound and even I heard it and I knew with the second book I and Louise Glick had come into my life and I really loved her and I never thought in my life I would ever meet her and she gave me this piece of advice that I could continue to make the same sound as the next book or I could wait for a new sound Mm -hmm. So that's why that second book, for, in my case, took me 11 years, because I wanted to make a new sound, and a lot of things in my life changed in that time frame. But basically, that second book is driven by reconciliation and forgiveness, and all the poems are spun out of that, and some of them are very long, because I think it takes a long time to understand forgiveness and and reconciliation, and I wanted to change the forms that I was working in. So I wrote long poems, I wrote prose poems, I wrote a sonnet. I'd never done that before. So I was deliberately changing the game with everything that I had come into into existence with. So it was, yeah, that's enough for me. Yeah, Mark, mm -hmm. Mark, you talk now. Mark's so <laughs> intelligent. He's not <laughs> Go. I, I think that, um, I've probably been more interested in what individual poems are mm -hmm. than in a larger project of what a book is, and that all of my collections have begun with individual poems that I have written. And then after they begin to accrue and I've written enough of them, I can stand back a little bit and begin to understand what is binding all of these together. Essentially, the write, for me, the writing of poems has been about the following of various obsessions. Um, that it's a kind of obsessive exploration of a subject. I think that for me too, my poems are uh, have been about what I don't know about something rather than uh, you know explanations of what I do know. And yeah. that the poem itself is a kind of are, are the tracks made in the snow that are about the exploration of a subject, the asking of a question. Um, I think that all of my books have centered around central themes, which I only became aware of later on. Um, in that way, I, I do believe in, in this phrase that our poems are smarter than we are, yeah. <laughs> that they reveal things to us um, yeah. over time that we true. don't know about ourselves. Yeah, That's amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> you brought up the word sound, um, yeah. and I was thinking, well, you know, there's <clears throat> the back cover of your books, People Leave Reviews, Louise Glick compares you to Chaucer you know, small praise, but, um, <clears throat> what do you, that. right, yeah. in the introduction of that book, um, so I suppose, you know, I've forgotten that question, but you work often in form, um, maybe, or, right? Yeah, right, yeah, because I think when I was teaching myself how to write, because yeah. I wasn't in an MFA program, I bought these four books at the Grolier Bookshop, which is in Cambridge, I think it still exists, but at the time, it was the only all-poetry bookstore, and and so I ordered these books that were how, they were like do-it-yourself kits, and I taught myself all the forms. And that first book I wrote, the whole thing was in form, and I had so much time on my hands because it took me 20 years to do it, and so somewhere in the middle of that I realized it was boring and not good, and I needed to break all the forms. But now I don't look at it very often, but when I do, I see the shadow of forms is littered throughout that book. So I like form because you can push against... It's sometimes it ja jangles your mind and you come up with something that you, you wouldn't normally come up with. So, but I'm kind of loose with it, you know, I, do, I don't... So, yeah, yeah. yeah.
I love yeah. um, your poem. What is it called? Dreamscape 7. I love the poems that scatter mm. um, in, in your early collection. So I guess what I was thinking of with the Chaucer line is everyone's like, this person descends from this person. There's a lineage, right? Um, you have antecedents, but do you guys think of other writers? I mean, obviously, sure. everyone has people they admire, they look mm. to. But I suppose how directly are you copying? <laughs> if that's the word yeah. you can use. Yeah. Well, I certainly had very influential teachers, and I think uh, I was very lucky to have a couple of teachers who really introduced me to worlds of poets and poetry that then kind of adopted me and took me in, right? So I, 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 uh, one of my teachers was Lucy Brock Broido, and mm -hmm. kind of through her I got to know the writer Stanley Kunitz and mm -hmm. other writers kind of centered around the Fine Arts Work Center of Provincetown and other places in Columbia University where I ended up uh, getting my graduate degree. And um, I also met the writer J.D. McClatchy. Now, both of these writers died this last year. Um, McClatchy introduced me to James Merrill and to um, uh, the composer Ned Roram and to other writers, um, to, to John Ashbery. Um, and kind of through him, I was introduced to this world of kind of queer poetics, a sort of world of... Um, of, of writers who had cultivated a particular aesthetic. And I'm grateful for both of those. Um, and, and I guess I could see myself as being part of that and being grateful for having had the opportunity to work with these people and the, the kind of gift of, of this lineage that they offered me. Um, Elizabeth Bishop was a huge influence for me, I think, and Sylvia Plath in the beginning, James Merrill, whom I had the good fortune to know towards the end of his life, made a big impact, and Gerard Manley Hopkins and uh, uh, Emily Dickinson, and the list goes on and on. Maybe class one more? I think so. Okay, um, talking about sound and, and lineage, um, you both have distinct voices, right? And you write a lot about the particular mm -hmm. and the mundane, but there's musicality to it. Um, and I mean, to me, your voice is very passionate. Have you guys, everyone says you find your voice later. Is that true, essentially? Have you always had um, the same voice in your lyric or has it developed? How has it developed? Has it changed? Um, you know, I, I think that's almost more of a question for a reader than the writer <laughs> than the writer himself or herself. But what I would say is that I think there is something, when I go back and look at my early work, there is something there that I recognize. Um, I have not turned against that work in any way. I, I appreciate that I was once 27 and yeah. writing poems, and I can look back at that mm. and see <laughs> that version of myself. Yeah. And I'm glad that those poems exist in the world. Um, uh, but I think there is, you know, what I think we do have are a limited number of subjects. I think mm -hmm. that, and I, and I think of subject with a capital S, right? So, you know, what happens, um, what happens to us when we die? Um, why do people lie to one another? Um, what does it mean to, to, to love something truly? You know, I mean, if I think of those subjects as being eternal and also being the reason poems are in the world. And we don't really choose those subjects. Those subjects choose us. Mm -hmm. And it's just our job to kind of pursue them and ask questions about them over time. Yeah, I don't really know what I'm doing. I think that's <laughs> Yeah, somebody later will figure it out. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Jordan. Thank, Thank you, Jordan. Yeah.